Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, 2016 year-end state and local tax update. Before we begin the presentation, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy webcast CPE standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the 2016 year-end state and local tax update. This webinar is the last in a three-part series addressing tax issues facing technology, life sciences, and communications companies. Thanks for joining us today. We also hope that you have found this series to be informative. We have received a lot of great feedback so far. Thank you for that. My name is Richard Krogan. I'm a partner in our San Francisco office. I'm the industry group tax leader for the technology group, and I will be your moderator today. Joining me today, today are three of my esteemed colleagues from our state and local tax team. First up is Adam Klein. Adam is a partner in our state and local tax group and is based in our Seattle office. Presenting with Adam is Anna Ferraro, a director in our state and local tax group based out of our Sacramento office. And last but not least is John Clausen. John is a director in our state and local tax group and is based in our Silicon Valley office. Today we'll cover a handful of topics. First, we'll start off with Adam and Anna who will cover the concept of nexus. This is the threshold question about whether companies are subject to various taxes in this specific state. And th this nexus concept is, is changing and the rules vary from state to state, so this is an important um, breakout uh, issue that needs to be understood. And then Adam and Anna will cover some specific issues related to sales and use and some gross receipts taxes. John will wrap up the, the presentation talking about some frequent state income tax issues. First, there's been a lot of changes to California law in the last year or so, um, and he'll address those. And he will also go through a number of other state tax law changes that may affect your 2016 taxes. As was mentioned in the introduction, participants will need to complete the four polling questions to receive credit, CPE credit. So our first polling question is an easy question. Um, we just wanted to get a sense of uh, some of the companies represented on the call today. Um, and, and we'll start off with that, is what, which is the largest source of tax revenue for states? The property tax, sales, sales and use, or gross receipts taxes, um, income taxes or some other sort of tax. Uh, so 
I'll give everyone some time to answer that, just a, a little bit of time. Um, just to get a sense of it'll kind of drive the conversation and where um, where where we see a, a lot of, of issues pop up. And with that, um, don't forget to hit the submit button. I got to we got to remember remind people to do that. Sometimes they don't submit it. And you need to answer these four for CPE credit. With that, I'm going to close it down in about ten seconds. And three, two, one. All right, there we go. Sales, sales and use and gross receipts. You're, you're absolutely right. And that actually um, constitutes about half of all um, state tax collections um, across the 50 states. Um, income tax is um, is the second uh, drives the most second most amount of revenue, about 42 uh, percent, um, and property tax comes in third, just like in this poll. So, um, all right, our, our people are pretty knowledgeable here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam, who's going to uh, kick off the discussion on Nexus. All right. Thank you, Rich. Okay. So it, there, there are some distinctions to be aware of with Nexus. Before I get into that, just kind of level set, um, Nexus is a legal concept, and it is necessary to have Nexus with a state, that state to have tax jurisdiction over an out-of-state company before any state taxes start to apply. So a lot of times we're evaluating whether we have uncollected sales tax or income tax issues. important to keep in mind that if Nexus doesn't exist, neither do the tax issues. So Nexus is the, one of the most important facets of state tax. Um, <clears throat> so it, and it's generally the level of connection to a state, again, to, for that state to have tax jurisdiction over that out-of-state company to impose income taxes, sales taxes, gross receipts taxes, things of that nature. Um, income tax nexus and sales tax nexus can differ. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court, 1992, ruled in Quill that physical presence is necessary for a state to assert a sales or use tax collection obligation on an out-of-state taxpayer Whereas state courts, some state Supreme Courts, have ruled that physical presence is not required in order to assert income tax nexus or franchise tax nexus, or in some cases, like Washington and Ohio, gross receipts tax nexus. So that's an important kind of stark um, contrast to keep in mind when you're looking at determining nexus if as an out-of-state business. Um, physical presence, again, sales tax nexus, economic nexus, income tax nexus, and there's some overlap that most of the time, not all the time, physical presence can create both income tax nexus and sales tax nexus. Okay. So, so click-through nexus is one of the trends that is uh, taking place in the U.S., Click-through nexus is when a resident state receives a commission for directing sales of a company through a link to a website or in another similar fashion. An example of this would be schools or not-for-profits who encourage you to use links from their websites when you shop at uh, major retailers. So the retailers pay a commission to schools, to these not-for-profits for sales that are made through the websites. The states have then come back and said that this click-through nexus, <coughs> you know, the, the click-through nexus, uh, the resident who is in state, whether it's a non-for-profit or, or a school, uh, is a resident of the state and is acting as an agent of the retailer. And since the agent is physically present in the state, the retailer now has a physical presence in the state and thus has created nexus. Um, this issue has been litigated. It's a position that was litigated uh, through the New York courts since it was originally targeting what was believed to target Amazon and Overstock.com. Unfortunately, the New York courts have upheld this position, and the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal on this. So having an in-state resident refer, refer customers to your website – um, and having them purchase. So it, it's two things. It does differ from advertising in that just putting a link to a retailer on your website is not enough to create the nexus, but putting a link and compensating that person uh, based on sales made through that link does create the nexus. 
the second area of nexus that uh, has been emerging as well is called affiliate nexus. Now, affiliate nexus is when there is a relationship between two or more retailers. The relationship may be an ownership or may be through operations. For example, if an out-of-state re retailer who has no physical presence in state A shares similar ownership to a retailer that is located in state A, state A can then claim that the out-of-state retailer has nexus with state A due to that shared ownership. The ownership requirements vary by state, but 50 to 80% 80 common ownership seems to be where we see the range that the states are looking at. So if you are a retailer who has a, an entity in state A with absolutely no sales and you have intentionally created a second entity outside of state A, but you have a lot of sales into state A, state A can say, hey, uh, these two entities, the one in our state that provides no, that makes no sales and the out-of-state retailer that does make sales are related. And even though the sales are not coming directly out of the company in our state, that that retailer does have, they are providing enough support, enough connection to our state that the out-of-state re retailer should be collecting tax in the state. Um, additionally, similarity of operations or complementary operations can pull a related ent entity into a state. For example, if Company 1 is located in State A and develops proprietary technology that is the basis for Company 2's product, and whether it's the basis that runs the website or maybe it's the software or some type of technical area that allows this product to, to be unique or sellable, um, that could be a, a that could be a, a proprietary, proprietary relationship. So although Company 2 does not have operations in State A, its operational dependence on Company A, which is a related entity, can be used by State or by Company 1, sorry, um, can be used by State A to assert that the Company 2 has nexus in the state. So similarity of business names um, could also drag or re tie two companies together. If your average person would not be able, would associate two companies with very similar names that are related um, and cannot tell the difference between the two, some states such as Arizona said, hey, that's enough. You're truly operating in our state. You're just trying to do it um, covertly. Um, however, states are not solely limiting their attempts to draw businesses into uh, under new interpretations of physical presence, which are what uh, the click-through and the affiliate nexus are. Um, they are also looking at, uh, at reporting requirements. So the latest trend started in 2010 by the state of Colorado. Um, instead of trying to assert nexus, the state passed a law requiring businesses that are not registered with the state to collect sales and use tax and to provide reports to Colorado consumers and to the state of Colorado. Colorado's requirements were, number one, that the retailer must include language on the invoice uh, to its Colorado customers that the customer is responsible for self-reporting any applicable use tax to the state of Colorado. And then at the end of the year, the retailer must then provide a summary statement to those Colorado customers summarizing their purchases for the year and again informing them that they are responsible for self-reporting applicable use tax. In addition, the retailer would have to provide information to the state of Colorado about purchases made during the year by Colorado customers. Um, failure to meet or abide by these reporting requirements uh, results in penalties being assessed by the state of Colorado against the retailer who has no physical presence in the state. So it appears that the intent of this law is to make the reporting requirements so onerous that the out-of-state retailer is just going to choose to register with the state of Colorado, collect their taxes, instead of having to deal with the reporting requirements and be subject to the penalties, which are pretty severe. Um, this law was immediately challenged in federal court by the Direct Marketing Association in a case called Direct Marketing Association versus Brohill. And although there were many twists and turns in this case, and it has been going on since uh, 2010, uh, the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals eventually ruled that Colorado's reporting requirements did not discriminate, discriminate against or unduly burden interstate commerce, uh, which are the tests of whether or not this is a constitutional law. Thus, the statute was deemed to be constitutional or not unconstitutional, and Colorado was allowed to uh, 
to start enforcing that law. The Direct Marketing Association did make a last, uh, a last, a last attempt to strike down the Colorado reporting requirements. So Colorado has not been enforcing it as of yet. However, earlier this week, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court did refuse to hear or declined to hear the case. Thus, we do expect Colorado to begin enforcing this reporting requirement soon. Um, and since Colorado's statute passed muster with the courts, uh, we have seen other states this year uh, begin passing similar reporting requirements, and we expect that trend to continue. Again, the idea is not that they're trying to assert nexus. The idea is that they're trying to make it such a burden by not being registered with their state to collect sales and use tax that you're going to voluntarily choose to do so. Um, the last trend we're starting to see, and this has occurred in Alabama and South Dakota, is the concept of economic nexus. And this is more of an income tax, uh, gross receipts tax concept. Um, Alabama and South Dakota at this point have passed laws that say that if you have sales to customers in their state over a certain threshold, um, I believe Alabama was about 250,000, South Dakota was much lower, probably around 100,000. But they're saying sales to their customers creates economic nexus with their state, um, and you are required to collect and remit sales tax. Now, they are, they have chosen to selectively enforce that at this time, and their intent is really to get this issue up through the court system and get some validation. Okay. Thanks, Anna. So in trends in factor presence nexus. So as I stated earlier, they're having economic connection with a state can create income tax nexus. And so some states choose to just write their doing business statutes as you know, having some sort of activity with the state or driving income from in-state sources can create nexus, whereas other states, namely factor presence nexus states, choose to have bright line thresholds. And so that being said, uh, sales exceeding certain thresholds or property or payroll exceeding certain thresholds create a presumptive nexus or de facto nexus, if you will, for income tax purposes. And as Anna was saying a moment ago, some states, namely Alabama and South Dakota, have decided to be very bold and defy Quill and use bright line nexus standards for sales tax purposes. So it'll be really interesting to see how this all plays out and reconciles with Quill and the denial of cert for the DMA case that Anna was referring to just a moment ago. Uh, trends in market-based sourcing. So you may be thinking, why does market-based sourcing matter for Nexus? Well, uh, market-based sourcing, sourcing of primarily uh, intangibles and services, uh, it tends to drive how you determine your receipts test for factor presence nexus. So if you're trying to figure out if you have 530 some odd thousand dollars of California source receipts to have nexus, you have to do that through the market-based sourcing provisions. So it's just kind of important to keep that in mind that they, the market-based sourcing rules work in tandem with the nexus rules. So that being said, with trends in single-factor sales, single-factor sales trends have also uh, mirrored the nexus trends and economic nexus, and states are shifting away from using payroll and property factors in measuring uh, net income for a state and <clears throat> moving towards a single sales factor of which most of the time, but not all of the time, the numerator of the sales factor for income tax purposes would be the measuring stick for approximating whether uh, income tax nexus exists for determining factor presence nexus. And, you know, again, states are trending towards more of a single sales factor, uh, a concept called exporting the tax base, where states are moving to try to pull most of their tax revenue from out-of-state companies while giving in-state companies a tax break. All right. Thanks, Adam. That uh, brings us to our second polling question. Um, again, it's a requirement for CPE. Um, pretty straightforward question, I believe. Um, a company must have employees in the state before the state can assert nexus. Yes or no? Must. Must the company have employees? 
Uh, and Adam, I just wanted to bounce a question off of you. So, um, some questions are coming in. Some good questions are coming in through the Q and A function. Um, um, and it, it, it's a good good way way to set the groundwork. Um, the question was, if I if, if the company doesn't properly collect sales tax, is the company liable, um, or or will that liability fall on the consumer? Good question. Um, if you don't, if so, if the company has nexus and fails to collect sales tax on taxable sales, um, most of the time, the liability for the uncollected sales tax will uh, will stick to that seller. And so the seller can have uncollected sales tax liability or seller liability, if you will. Um, and so you can absolutely have uh, you know, uh, liabilities that could emerge from not having collected sales tax that can come up in diligence. It's actually a common sticking point um, that due diligence teams uh, have and, and hold back in escrows when it's been determined that it has been collected. Thanks, Adam. All right, with that, I'm going to close down the polling question, give everyone the last few minutes, few seconds to hit the submit button. Remember, hit the submit button. With that, no is a resounding answer, and that is correct. As we just talked about, there's lots of other ways to create um, that create nexus. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Adam and Anna to talk about some um, more issues related to sales and use and gross receipts taxes. Okay. Thanks, Rich. So on that concept, sales and use and gross receipts taxes, uh, the, the technology space is one that is always outpacing state legislatures. So a couple things to keep in mind. Some states do a really good job of being able to keep pace with technology, roughly speaking, at the time the bills are going through um, the legislative sessions, uh, but, but many do not. And so there, but it doesn't, you know, keeping that in mind, it doesn't change the fact that state revenue agencies are going to continue to try to raise revenue on what they think should be taxable irrespective of whether the statutes or regulations actually support their positions. And so with the advent of software licensing, moving away from being delivered on tangible mediums to downloaded licenses to being in the cloud and the evolution of more uh, automated processing services, the states are hungry to tax these sorts of revenue streams. Um, so, you know, as I said, uh, the, the, the states don't always keep pace, and so with that, many states that impose sales tax on, say, software as a service, um, uh, some of them have statutes that specifically uh, impose sales tax on software as a service or remote access software, remotely access software, lots of different terminology that's out there. Um, other states they take the position that SaaS, software as a service, is subject to tax merely because it's kind of like downloaded software, and the state may coincidentally tax downloaded software, and there may be cases or administrative guidance that's out there um, that would that would uh, support their position from a state authority. Okay. So moving on to uh, downloaded software, we'll start with that and move through uh, onto SAS. So the taxability of software usually begins with the determination of whether software is either pre-written or custom software. Uh, pre-written software is generally software that is not designed or developed by the author to create or, or creator to the specifications of a specific purchaser, while custom software is software generally created for a single person and is not resold to other customers. Although some level of customization or configuration may be done on pre-written software, uh, that generally does not uh, result in pre-written software becoming classified as custom software, and that's a, a common misconception uh, with people thinking that the, the configuration or the consulting work that is done uh, changes pre-written software into custom software. So when, sof when software is purchased, the retailer usually grants a license to use the software as part of the sale of software. Next, once the software is classified as either pre-written or custom, the next characteristic to look at is in determining the taxability is how the software is delivered. Is the software delivered on tangible medium, such as a flash drive, and this is very, more, it still occurs, but it's more the historical method of doing so. Is it delivered electronically, such as de downloaded by the customer from a website or through a link sent by an email? 
um, or pro provided electronically through an application service provider. In an application service provider, you really don't have delivery of the software to the customer. It is the software sitting on a server um, by a vendor who has agreed to host uh, the software for you. So states have struggled with the question of whether or not software delivered through an ASP um, application service provider is subject to tax because, number one, the customer never has physical possession of the software. So has there been a transfer of software? Um, however, states are choosing to look not at whether a customer has possession of the software in these situations, but whether or not they have access and control to the software. Um, so this is a chart uh, from RIA, and it's a, what they refer to as a quick answer chart. And the po point of this is to give you an idea of which states uh, tax downloaded software. So the tax taxation of downloaded software is not always specifically stated in the state statutes or regulations, as Adam mentioned. Some states, such as Arizona and Texas, specifically state that the sale of software program is taxable regardless of the method used to transfer the program. So in those states, you have very specific uh, it's specific, specifically stated in the, the laws and regs. Um, then you have states such as Colorado, which has flip-flopped on the issue of the taxability of downloaded software. Uh, in Colorado, it was exempt for a period of time but became taxable in 2010 uh, for a couple of years during the economic downturn and is now exempt again. Um, however, with Colorado, although the download software is exempt in Colorado, it may be taxable at the local level. So Colorado is one of five states uh, that we refer to as having home rule. And in those situations, the local jurisdictions, meaning the cities and the counties, do have the ability to pass and administer their own sales and use tax laws. So Colorado and Louisiana are, are the, states, the, the states that usually come into focus there. However, Arizona, which is starting to trend away from that, um, Idaho and Alabama also have home rule jurisdictions. So don't let a state like Colorado, who, who doesn't tax it, don't think you're, you're out of the woods there. You need to look down to the next level with a, a home rule state. Uh, then you have a state such as California that specifically exempts the transfer program via remote telecommunications um, and is exempt as long as the purchaser does not obtain possession of any tangible personal property. Um, and that term or that phrase, as long as the purchaser does not obtain possession of any tangible property, is an important phase. So what you'll see is that some types of software are delivered electronically but require a security device, such as a dongle or a code, to be able to be usable. Uh, and the dongle or the code, a dongle is a small piece of uh, hardware about the size of a thumb drive. And anytime your security code or anything like that is delivered on a small on, on any type of tangible personal property, such as that, uh, a state like California is going to say, hey. I realize you downloaded the software, but you need that little piece of hardware in order to use the software. Therefore, that software was delivered electronically. Keep in mind that dongle, the cost of that dongle is, is minimal. However, it is a piece of hardware, and that will change the taxability of the software. Okay, SaaS. So states have struggled on how to tax, tax software as a service or SaaS. So SaaS is a web-based software that is hosted by the service provider, and some states will refer to SaaS as remotely accessed software. Most states' laws and regs were written a long time ago, and electronic services such as SaaS were never anticipated. Added to that is the fact that states want to preserve their sales and use tax revenue, so they want SaaS to be taxable. So they're, they're going to try to pull it in under definitions wherever they possibly can. With SaaS, a retailer generally charges a subscription fee so the customer has access and the right to use the software but never possesses the software. In many instances, there is no license granted with the SaaS, unlike sales of software. So if there is no license granted with a SaaS subscription, is it a service or is it software? A state that has broad sales tax base, which includes sales of services, is likely to classify SaaS as a service. Doesn't mean it's exempt. It could be a taxable service, such as data processing, information service, uh, a state with a narrow sales tax base, which excludes services or taxes limited services, is more likely to classify SaaS as a software that is delivered electronically. However, some states do classify software delivered electronically as tangible personal property and will tax it as such. 
But is SAS really the same as software is down, that is downloaded? Software that is downloaded by the customer resides on the customer's computer. SAS is never downloaded and does not reside on the customer's computer. So there is a disconnect there. Again, these rulings, the interpretations by these states are their attempt to tax the, the service because they don't want to lose the revenue. Um, so some states have addressed the issue through rulings. Other states excuse me, realize that their laws do not cover this area and have chosen to pass new laws specifically addressing the taxability of SAS. And we have a few states that we'll be going through shortly, and we will discuss these law changes and highlight a few states that have made changes to their laws. Um, and here is a, a chart showing the taxability, uh, the states highlight, highlighted are the states that do tax SAS. So Arizona is a, a good example here, is a, a state that addresses the, the taxability of SAS through a series of rulings. So as you may be aware, Arizona imposes a transaction privilege tax, which is, imposes taxes based on categories of transactions. Um, their broadest category is the retailing category. Uh, which includes the taxation of software, but does not impose tax on professional personal services. However, the rulings issued by Arizona tax SAS under its tangible personal property rental category, not the retailing category. Um, and that's, they view the provision of SAS as a leasing transaction. Um, and they probably were not able to fit the definition of SAS or SAS, the taxation of SAS under the retailing classification since there is that exemption for personal or professional services. Um, Adam? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Anna. Good summaries. So, as I stated earlier, there's you know, software, software as a service, and then kind of the automated data processing information services arena. And it's really important in this kind of context of assessing, um, am I selling software as a service uh, or am I selling an automated data processing service? So you kind of have to look at it whether it's almost like a push or pull type of service in the context of what's being provided to the customer. Um, so if you kind of think about it from a Venn diagram perspective, there's Tangible software, taxable in almost every state. Downloaded software, taxable in most states. Software as a service, taxable in fewer states, but still a lot. And then information services, taxed in much fewer states. So the distinction is really important to pick up on, Texas being one state that taxes everything. So, uh, But there's a lot of states that will have much different results in terms of what the taxability is and all those different revenue streams. So that being said, <clears throat> here's a handful of states that impose tax on information services, data processing services, and something to keep in mind is that in a few of these states, namely Hawaii and South Dakota, um, that and, and New Mexico, that's more operative of the fact that their sales taxes, well, in South Dakota, sales tax applies to all services, but in Hawaii and New Mexico um, in particular, their sales taxes operate more as gross receipts taxes, so they're kind of a blanket tax that apply to everything and can be passed on to the consumer, with the yellow states, again, being the states that generally impose tax on these types of services. So that being said, again, as I was alluding earlier, a lot of states have ambiguous statutory and administrative authority regarding technology. The pace of technology significantly outpaces the legislatures. Uh, examples are Pennsylvania and New York. And what you often see in a lot of these states is the statutes and the regulations do not often support taxability of software as a service or information services. New York's an exception to that. New York does have specific language on information services. Um, but it, it's important to know because, you know, as on the recommended approach at the bottom of the slide, uh, you, you want to interpret the, the language and the, and the authority very carefully in terms of what, um, what, how the law and the rule is going to actually apply to your facts. So for purposes of when you charge tax to your customers or how you may or may not uh, shore up the reserves on the financial statements. 
All right, Adam, I think we're going to go to our next polling question. Um, and I think I'm getting it there. Um, uh, how many states do you file sales tax returns in? Um, zero, one, less than 10, more than 10, or all states? Um, and, and with that, we, we got um, one question, um, or, or one question I had for you. Um, are, are states, I think I read that to some states, do you know how many states have changed their laws with respect to sales tax this year? Um, I don't know if we have an exact count as to which ones have. We just It tends to be a trend that we're seeing, uh, whether it's in, in uh, related to, uh, to SaaS and software or other areas. Um, we've seen other states make some broad sales tax changes. I think in North Carolina they had stuff outside of the, the software technology and they just came through and made a broad stroke on, on sales tax changes. Okay. Um, all right, and, and then one question came in from the audience. Um, should it, they're interpreting that sales tax is interpreted broadly, and there's, there's you know very high likelihood of nexus. Should they just retire or file sales tax returns in every state? Well, <laughs> go ahead, Adam. I uh, say uh, no. Just you you want to only be filing returns for those states in which you have the legal requirement. Um, there's a lot of lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, one th there's administrative burden, there's costs associated with compliance, um, and you don't want to be caught in any sort of precarious legal situations where you may have collected tax on transactions or services that were not subject to tax, um, and uh, have uh, you know groups or classes of taxpayers um, uh, present any sort of legal quagmire for you, if you will. All right. Thank you. All right, now everyone, uh, remember, hit the submit button. Um, I want everyone to get their CPE credit, and we're going to close it down here in uh, about five seconds. So last call. All right, let's move forward. So um, so we've got a, a, a broad range. So following up on that last question, we do have uh, about 9% file in all the states. Um, uh, and and uh, about 25% and more than 10. Um, as as you can um, infer, yeah, the states are, are reaching out to to collect more revenue from from out of state uh, companies, and this is an easy way for them to do that. Um, so next up, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to um, now talk about income tax, income and taxes, and franchise taxes. John. Yes. Thank you, Rich. Okay. Uh, so first off, I'll talk about California and kind of the the impact that the economic nexus rules have had for for California startup companies that may be thinking that they really only need to file in California and don't have any activity outside of California. So in in the past, that meant that you didn't have to worry about apportionment and that you could just, you know, if you had a loss, you could pick up that loss as 100% California. But an issue that has come up is, is with regard to who must apportion income. So now, and, and the standard hasn't changed. It's basically anybody whose activity is taxable under California's view of what is taxable both within and without the state. Um, but given the economic nexus rules, California would now consider many companies to be taxable just as a result of having sales that exceed its economic nexus threshold outside of California, and that can cause a company to be considered apportionable. Um, so another another issue that comes up around this is if you have an employee somewhere outside of California, uh, that's the problem on this slide is that you may not be generating any receipts, but you're apportionable. And so now that we're a single sales factor state, what's the apportionment? And the the point of view of the franchise tax board is that 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 taxpayer that has zero receipts but is apportionable would have uh, 
a zero factor and wouldn't if they have a loss they wouldn't be able to carry over any loss to a future year so is when you have zero receipts is the fraction really zero over zero and while mathematicians might dispute that um, in California, the, the view of the FCB, as I said, is, is yes, that you would have zero apportionment. Another issue that comes up uh, under with the new law is whether or not, as a result of having a foreign affiliate, you would be considered apportionable. Um, and California has enacted Finnegan rules for purposes of sourcing sales, which means basically that if any member of the group has nexus outside of California, then every member of the group is considered to have nexus. And so following that logic, if you had a foreign affiliate, it's likely that California would consider you to have nexus outside of California and therefore be required to apportion. However, a water's edge election could make that issue a moot point since your California filing group would no longer include the foreign affiliate in a water's edge situation in most cases. Um, one planning technique that companies may want to consider when they have zero receipts is to potentially capitalize uh, expenses such as R&D expenses using the 59E capitalization election that allows you, instead of deducting those expenses currently, to capitalize and deduct over a 10-year period. Um, and so that maybe will push the deductions into a year in which you can actually benefit from them as opposed to having them occur in a year in which you have no receipts and, and therefore no apportionment factor. Another possible solution to this problem is to seek alternative apportionment with the state of California um, under what we call a 25137 petition. Um, or it's basically where the regular rules don't give you a fair result that you can go to the state and ask for some alternative to the regular rules. For example, if, you're re if under the regular rules you have zero receipts, and therefore no losses, you can go to the state and say, well, this isn't really a fair reflection of my income. What if I use maybe payroll and property as an example and come up with a, you know, some kind of apportionment that will allow me to carry forward these losses? The one thing to consider there, though, is that if you ask for that in a loss year, then when you become profitable, the state may expect you to use a similar formula as opposed to going back to, you know, a, a zero receipts, although I, I suppose in a profitable situation you wouldn't have zero. And, and so that, that could potentially work out um, where, you know, you could get a, a good result in your loss year and then also have uh, the regular rules apply during the income year. So the next issue I'll talk about is regarding the uh, MTC election, which probably most of you heard if you were kind of following the developments in the state tax area that the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert in the case of Gillette versus the Franchise Tax Board, which was a long-running case that involved a, an old issue around the ability to elect to use a three-factor apportionment formula instead of the regular formula that is applicable under California law. Um, and back at the time that the case was originated, they were disputing whether they were required to just use the double-weighted sales factor with the three-factor formula. And over time, that developed into a question of whether California taxpayers were required to use single sales factor or could they elect to uh, apportion using the three-factor formula of MTC. 
the California Supreme Court ruled on the issue on December 31st of 2015 in favor of the state, and then the taxpayer uh, petitioned to the, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court denied to hear the case. So they, the case is, is essentially over with in California, and California taxpayers are not allowed to elect to utilize the MTC election going forward, or, or act for that matter, uh, you know, since California modified their statute to require double weighted sales factor back in '93, the, the position in California is that the MTC election was never available after that. Um, there is ongoing litigation in in Michigan, and the taxpayers have requested review by the U.S. Supreme Court in Michigan, and so there could actually be kind of a revival of this issue, and it will be interesting to see how this plays out in California, whether whether or not if the Supreme Court hears the case in Michigan and rules in favor of the taxpayer, would that impact taxpayers in California given the uh, unfavorable denial of cert of the Gillette case. And I think that, you know, there there is a possibility that that uh, California taxpayers could see a revival of their ability to make the election if things play out in favor of the taxpayers in the Michigan case. So it's something to keep our eyes on. And uh, lastly, uh, 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 switching gears here, another development um, in important development that happened in 2016 is that combined reporting became effective for Connecticut, as well as the previously mentioned Finnegan approach to determining who has nexus um, in a group filing situation. So in the area of apportionment, the, the trend, as Adam mentioned earlier, has been to adopt market-based sourcing, but cost of performance sourcing does still exist in a number of states. Um, that is basically usually an all-or-nothing type of approach to looking at sourcing receipts based on where the costs incurred in connection with the income-producing activity that generated the receipts were located. So if you, even though your customer might be in New Jersey, if you incurred all of your costs relating to those sales in Oregon, then Oregon being a cost of performance state would say that's an Oregon receipt. Uh, on the other side of the coin is, is the market-based sourcing, which that is the trend and that would be looking at where the, usually in a case of a services situation, it's where the benefit of the service is received by the customer. So as I mentioned, Oregon is a cost of performance state and this case, which was decided in 2015, was uh, an interesting case around cost of performance and it involved whether or not the income producing activity was within Oregon or with or or outside of Oregon and it really focused on what is the income producing activity and what co what are the costs of performance that should be considered in connection with that income producing activity um AT&T was the taxpayer in the case and interestingly they they raised this same issue in a Massachusetts case which ruled differently. Um, the ruling in the case was that uh, for Oregon purposes, you only really consider the marginal costs associated with each transaction and all of the historical uh, and capital equipment type costs associated with providing the services that AT&T was providing were not taken into account in, in looking at the income producing activity and the costs associated with it. And so that's, I think, a, 
a commonality that Oregon would have with other states that have similar law, although as I, as I mentioned, there was a Massachusetts ruling where the law was similar, where they actually said that you wouldn't source to Massachusetts because the, all of the historical capital equipment costs associated with the services, which were outside of Massachusetts, um, were greater than the, the costs inside of the state. And so in that case, they ruled differently. So it's, it's a good example of how, you know, a, a cost of performance state doesn't, that it doesn't mean that all cost of performance states will source similar revenue similarly. It's a good example, I guess, of how there's not really uniformity even when the rules are the same. So I'm going to skip over to the next slide, which is uh, more in the area of developments. So New York, something of interest to the high tech industry would be that New York for emerging, if you qualify as an emerging tech company, you can get a more favorable tax rate of 5.7% rather than 7.1%. And it's a very broad definition of who can qualify for that, so it's something to to double check to make sure you're taking advantage of that if you if you do qualify. Uh, DC is another area that has some pretty favorable rules for, for tech companies, provided that you have a presence in in DC. You need to have an office and two or more employees, but if you do, you can get some very generous benefits. Uh, along those same lines, California now has a, a very generous program where if you apply, if you're a growing company and you have uh, plans over the next five years to increase your headcount and invest in property and equipment in the state, the California Competes Credit is something that you should consider and we're actually very timely in talking about this because in January there will be a three-week period during which taxpayers can apply uh, for this credit and they're giving away a hundred million dollars in credits in January and then again in March uh, I believe the amount is 60 million that that the state will be awarding to taxpayers and it, it is something that you have to apply for um, and Moss Adams actually can help with that. We, we've done that work for a number of clients. Um, so, or, or it can be done. It doesn't. It can be done by the clients themselves. But it's something that is coming up, and that companies should consider. There is a, an annual follow-up to check, double check on companies, basically, to, to see if they've met the the commitments that they agreed to in the application for the credit. So it, there is potentially some clawback, but it, if, you, if you get accepted into the program, it can be very lucrative. It's common where companies, you can go on the website and actually view the companies that have received awards over the last few years, but it's not uncommon to see companies that, that are committing to creating 20 new jobs get six-figure credits. This slide, I'm sorry for the small font, um, but there were so many things to fit on there, and that was kind of the point of the slide, was that there's a lot of changes, and this is just a select group of changes that I thought would be interesting to, to our audience today. Um, but, you know, some of the things on there are, we, there, there are new factor-based uh, doing business thresholds. Those are indexed for inflation. So for 2016 in California, that the sales threshold at which point you're considered to be doing business is at 547,000, uh, whereas it was 536 in the prior year. Um, Delaware adopting single sales factor. New York has issued regulations on uh, market sourcing. So there's a number of 
of pretty interesting state developments in the income tax area to, to look into here. All right, John, thank you. Um, we're going to go now to our last polling question. So for everyone who um, is still on, it looks like most people are, are, are still on, um, remember to answer this question. How many states do you file income tax returns in? So the prior question was about sales tax. This is about income tax returns. Um, uh, John, a question came in, and I just wanted to um, have you answer it. Um, it's, it's a good question, um, and, and one that sometimes is hard to, un, to, to believe. Um, uh, a company is a startup company, and they're you know, incorporated in Delaware, but they're based here in California, and they have some receipts, but no profit. Um, but they have an employee based outside of California. Are they at risk for losing its California NOL? Uh, I would say yes. Um, now, the, there is the option of the alternative apportionment petition with the state to to say that, well, that's not fair, um, and the state is actually, you know, sympathetic to, to the issue and likely would work with a taxpayer in that situation to come up with an alternative. But absent that, then the, the rules would point to a zero apportionment if you had no California receipts. Okay, so they'd need to consider where the receipts are, either from California businesses and non-California businesses. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very nice. All right, so again, hit the submit button, and we will wrap this up. All right, so um, so it looks like uh, you know most people file in, in, in a number of states. There's um, wow, there's a few that file in zero states. So maybe, maybe they're individuals that are, uh, are are on the line. Um, um, some with one and, and still a few in, in all income tax states. So that's um, good to know. We do see that um, more and more and more common. Um, with that, uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour. We appreciate everyone joining us. Um, we hope you found this informative. Um, I want to wish everyone uh, happy holidays. And with that, I'm going to turn it over back over to Emily to close us up. Great. Thank you, Rich, and thank you to all of our presenters for a great presentation today. Uh, if you asked a question that we didn't have time to get to, we'll be happy to follow up with you via email after the webcast. I'll be keeping the console open for a few minutes here, so if you think of something, feel free to ask us in the Q&A window, or you can reach out to one of our presenters directly. Uh, as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet in order to receive that credit. And this is available to download in the slide deck and handouts icon at the bottom of your screen. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE, CPE icon also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be keeping this console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate or ask any last-minute questions. And a copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time.